happy to have you with us today. My name is Vesdana, and I would like to welcome you in front of the whole Jobberty team. For those who maybe don't know who we are, we are a developers community with more than 70,000 users and a place where you can explore ID companies, ID jobs, and read experiences from your colleagues from the industry. We are currently present in six markets, Serbia, Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria, Macedonia, and Slovenia. And we strongly believe that sharing is caring. And that is why we have started this series of free webinars with industry experts. This is our eighth webinar. And today we are gonna be talking about modular monoliths. We are happy to welcome Milan. Milan, welcome and thank you for being here. Milan is, uh, sorry. <laughs> Milan is a software architect and tech YouTuber, and he will be sharing with us uh, some tips and tricks on how to build the modular monolith and lessons that he has learned along the way. And one more thing, we're going to be having uh, a QA section, session on the end of the webinar, so please feel free to ask any questions that you maybe have for Milan or for us in the QA section. I don't wanna be wasting our precious time any longer. So Milan, the floor is all yours. Thank you for the delightful introduction. And uh, thank you to Jobberty for extending this invitation to me. Uh, it's an honor to be talking to you today. Uh, my name is Milan. Uh, I'm a software architect by day and content creator in my spare time. Although you could argue that creating content is my primary occupation, given how much uh, I share daily on the various social medias that I'm present on. Uh, you can find me on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, and on my website where I write a weekly blog. You can see all the links on the screen. And without further ado, I'm going to jump into what you all came here for today which is modular monoliths. I'm going to talk about my experience using this architecture on a real project for the past two years. I'm going to explain as best as I can how you can build a modular monolith and what are some of the lessons that we learned along the way. Unfortunately, we had to learn those lessons the hard way, but I'm hoping that in sharing my experience today, you're going to be able to learn those lessons right away and you won't make the same mistakes that we did. So what is our agenda for today? We're going to briefly talk about the monolith architecture. Then we're going to jump into microservices just on a high level. I'm also going to do a comparison between monoliths and microservices. And then we're going to do a deep dive into modular monoliths. I'm going to explain what this architecture is, how you can build one, what are the challenges of actually building a proper modular monolith, and what are some of the lessons that I learned along the way. So here you can see the monolith. What we mean when we say monolith architecture is we have just one application representing the system. Typically, it's going to be one solution if you are working in a .NET environment, so that one solution with one executable represents the monolith. And these days, it's considered kind of old fashioned. Everybody wants to be working in some other kind of architecture because it looks cool on CVs, among other things. But I think there is a lot of beauty in creating a good solid monolith which is why I'm trying to talk about modular monoliths, which are, in my opinion, a good way to build monoliths. And one of the issues with monoliths and why people moved away from them is limited scalability. And what I mean by this is you only have one application, one system. And if you want to scale something, you only can scale that system. I'm going to talk about this more in just a moment. On the other end of the spectrum, we have microservices. So here's our representation of a very complicated system where each node on the screen is one microservice. 
And I'm sure there are actually real world systems that look a lot like this. And if you're working in a system like this, I am sure you're having a lot of fun. So when we say microservices, we mean that many individual services, each doing their own job, form the whole larger system. These days it's considered cutting edge and cool. Everybody wants to be working with microservices because they are very popular, mainly because it's challenging to work with them, but it's also fun and exciting. And one strong advantage of microservices is that at least in theory, they are infinitely scalable because whenever you want to scale something, you can scale that service either vertically or horizontally. Or if you have a bottleneck, you can extract it into a separate service and then scale that independently. So let's try to compare monoliths and microservices on a few points. The first is in terms of deployment. For monoliths, we have one deployment artifact, whereas for microservices, we have many, or rather for each service that is part of our microservice system, we have a deployment artifact. And for microservices, you're going to find that deployment is generally a lot more complicated and a lot, a lot more things can go wrong than with monoliths. When it comes to communication in a monolith, typically components talk to each other by simple method calls. Given the nature of the system is everything is one, everything is in one physical application. And with microservices, it's a little bit different because each of your service is an independent application running in its own server. So your services, in, if they want to talk to each other, they have to resort to using network calls, typically using HTTP, but there are other approaches like messaging, for example. Now, when it comes to scalability, monoliths are usually vertically scalable very easily. You can always beef up that server where your monolith is running, make it a bigger machine. And um, you can horizontally scale a monolith, but the downside is you're scaling the entire application and not necessarily the bottleneck that is probably causing you trouble, where with microservices, you have the freedom to scale both horizontally and vertically, and even extract services from your existing services if you need to scale some part of your system further. When it comes to databases, in a monolith system, you will typically only have one database, which is very easy to work with. And with microservices, you have usually one database per service, but your entire system is comprised of many individual databases, which adds another layer of complexity. Transactions are available almost out of the box with monoliths because you're usually working with just one database. So you are transactional by the nature of the system. And with microservices, it becomes very interesting because if you want to enforce consistency among services, you have to resort to using distributed transactions, which they slow performance and they introduce a lot of complexity the more services you're trying to keep consistent, which is why people typically tend to trade off consistency and embrace eventual consistency where you commit a transaction inside of a single service, which is transactional or consistent. And then you somehow notify the other services in your system of the change that happened. And eventually your system converges to a consistent state. And when it comes to scaling teams, again, we have kind of opposing points with a monolith. It, is, it becomes difficult to scale with a large team because everybody is working in the same code base. There are a lot of conflicts, a lot of teams making changes to potentially the same parts of code, and it's kind of messy to work with. With microservices, you can make sure the service is large enough to fill the needs of your team and not 
small enough so that nobody has enough work to do. So it's very easy to scale microservices with large teams where each team can be responsible for one or more services depending on how big your services are. So I have a quote here from a guy named Martin Fowler. You might have heard of him. He's actually very influential in our industry. And he said, you shouldn't start a new project with microservices, even if you're sure your application will be big enough to make it worthwhile. Now, I'm going to give you a moment to ponder on this quote and try to think of what he, what, what he actually tried to tell us when he said this. So in my eyes, the reason you shouldn't be starting a project with microservices is because you are going to have a tendency to create, to make your system very granular. You're going to want to make microservice for this and microservice for that. And before you know it, you have dozens of microservices. Whereas if you started with a monolith application and then work with that for as long as you could have, and the benefit of that is you're going to naturally see where the bottlenecks are in your system. And when bottlenecks start appearing in your system, that's a very good sign that that part of your system can be scaled out into a separate service. So it's kind of a more natural evolution towards microservices. But again, if you build a monolith the traditional way, moving into microservices becomes a little bit difficult. So what if we could have the best of both worlds? If we could get the physical architecture of a monolith where everything is still inside of one system and one physical application, one deployment artifact. And on the other hand, we have a logical architecture of microservices where individual features of the system are kind of naturally grouped together as they would be inside of a microservice. And an added benefit is to have the ability to move to a microservice architecture easily. So we can achieve this and it is called a modular monolith. So I'm going to try to explain now what a modular monolith is. And I'm going to start by sharing a few definitions of the modular monolith with you. So the first definition says, a modular monolith is a software design approach in which a monolith is designed with an emphasis on interchangeable and potentially reusable modules. So this is kind of a long definition, but the, the highlight is interchangeable and reusable modules. Okay, let's see another definition. So a modular monolith is an explicit name for a monolith system designed in a modular way. So we can see that kind of everything revolves around the word, around the word modular. And the definition of the word modular is consisting of separate parts that when combined form a complete whole. I'm not going to read the rest of the definition, but the main point here is you have distinct parts in your system that are kind of independent on their own, but together when they comprise, when they come together, they form a complete system. In our world, this is going to be an application. So everything is easier to visualize with a diagram. So I prepared a monolith diagram here of a sample e-shop application or e-commerce application, if you will. And I did actually work on a similar system for the previous two years. So I'm using that as an inspiration. So if it were a monolith, a typical monolith architecture, you would have one application. For example, it can be on ASP.NET Core Web API. And all of the components in our system are going to be C Sharp class libraries, for example. And we have just one database in the system. Now, if we were to convert this system into microservices, 
we could end up with something like this. So here you can see four separate microservices. We have the catalog service, which is responsible for telling us what products are available in our system to be bought. Then we have the order service, which is responsible for creating, managing orders, shipping them, getting, um, taking care of payments and so on. We have the customer service, which takes care of the users in the system, which are rather the customers. And then the collaboration service, which exists so that customers can interact with sales representatives to create an order because in this system, creating an order is very complicated. It's kind of a custom-made e-commerce application. So you can see kind of the contrast with these two systems. On the one hand, everything is monolithic together. On the other hand, everything is kind of nicely organized into individual services where each of them provides its own functionalities. So if we were to try to combine uh, these two diagrams into one, where we want to achieve the physical architecture of a monolith so that we have one system, and yet we want to keep this logical separation that we have with microservices, we would end up with something like this. So this is how a modular monolith would look like. Each of your services would now become a module inside of your modular monolith. But at the end of the day, this is still just one monolithic application. It's one physical application. And all of your components or modules inside of the system are interacting with the same database. Now, I want to highlight here that there are explicit boundaries around the modules. And the arrows here are actually all pointing to the database. They don't represent interaction between modules, although I will talk about that in a moment. So let's talk about what are the challenges of building a modular monolith. And as I walk you through the challenges, it's going to become a lot clearer how you actually should build a modular monolith. So the first challenge is actually identifying and defining your modules and bounded contexts. The second challenge is solving communication between modules. You'll see that there are multiple approaches to, to solve this. And the third challenge is solving module in data independence and isolation. I'll talk about this in depth in the last part. So let's start with defining modules and bounded contexts. So what modules actually are supposed to represent are cohesive sets of functionalities, where cohesive means something that naturally fits together. So if you re recall from our previous example, we had a couple modules. For example, probably something that you can easily relate to is orders. So everything around the orders for functionality will naturally flow together into a cohesive set of functionalities. We also call this a module. On the other hand, we have a catalog module, which covers everything related to representing line items and other things that are available inside of the eShop application. So one definition of what the module can be is the term bounded context, which comes from the book, Domain Driven Design, which was written by Eric Evans. I recommend everyone should read this book, even though, even if you may not like the ideas represented in the book and you don't want to use them in your code, that's perfectly fine. But I think you're going to be a better engineer after reading this book because some, of I some ideas uh, presented in the book are very, very good. One of those ideas is a bounded context. And what a bounded context means is it represents a boundary within a domain where a par particular domain model applies. So again, I'm coming back to the definition of modules where 
I highlighted that they kind of represent a boundary around a set of functionalities, which also aligns with bounded contexts. And an interesting thing with bounded contexts is that a single entity, or you can envision it as a table in the database, can belong to more than one bounded context. An example of that can be a user. A user represents different things in the bounded context of an order and different thing in the bounded context of a payment and different thing in the bounded context of a shipment, for example, but it's still the same physical entity. So one way also to envision modules is that each module can be treated as a separate application. This also has implications in how you define a module in your actual code, which I'm going to talk about now. And I want to discuss how do you actually architect an individual module once you have figured out what are these features that you believe belong to this module, what do you do next? So I said that you can envision a module as a separate application which means that you need to apply some sort of architecture to your module. And you're going to have many modules potentially inside of your modular monolith. One example architecture that you can apply is the layered architecture, which is very standard. You have just three layers, one for your user interface, which in our case is probably going to be an API. Then you have one layer for your business logic and one more layer for the database. Another option for how you can architect a module is using the clean architecture. You, if you're following me on social media, you probably know that I'm a big fan of the clean architecture. This is because I've used it extensively on many projects and I have found it to be very good for solving many problems. With the clean architecture, you can represent your layers of of your domain. And in, when comprised together, all of the layers represent one module and you can have more than one individual modules. And lastly, one architecture that has been gaining a lot of popularity recently is the vertical slice architecture where you have a vertical slice spanning all of the, for example, here layers of the layered architecture, but kind of all of them are physically placed together so that it's easier to navigate individual features. So it doesn't matter really which architecture you choose for your modules. You even have the freedom to choose different architectures for different modules. But what I want you to take out of this is that one module should be architected like an individual application even though it's part of your monolith. If you want to see a good example of what a modular monolith looks like, here's a link to a repository on GitHub, which contains an example of a modular monolith with domain-driven design. I personally use this repository during my research of modular monoliths, and I found it very, very nice to, to kind of see what the, the concept is and then try to kind of expand it with my own ideas. Thank you very much for, for sharing the link in the chat. Um, so moving on, let's talk about communication between modules. So every module is going to expose some sort of public API that other modules can call. This public API can be maybe an interface that other modules can call to interact with that module that is exposing the public API, or it can be something else. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. Now, it's important that there are no references allowed to other modules in the system, except the public API. So if we have two modules, let's for example say that they are architected 
using the vertical slice architecture, they are only allowed to call the public APIs that they expose. And they cannot reference anything else inside of other modules. Now, this how you achieve this is you hide implementation details of your module, modules internally. In C Sharp, you can achieve this using the internal keyword, which helps you hide the given class that is decorated with this keyword inside of that project. So this is how you can achieve kind of implementation hiding between modules and only expose a public API that other modules can call. Now, when it comes to actually implementing this, you have two approaches. One approach is using method calls. So let's say the catalog module is exposing a public API and the order module is interested in calling that API. This is going to be an interface for the catalog module and also the implementation is going to reside there. But the order module will be allowed to reference this interface and at runtime it's going to be provided the actual implementation. So the benefit of this approach is it's really fast because you're relying on in-memory calls, which are both reliable and performant. You can only call the public API of other modules. And the problem is, and potential pain point, that this introduces runtime coupling. So you are calling the public interface of another module, but at runtime, an interface can be instantiated. So if you are using the interface, something has to implement that interface and actually run that code. So you're introducing coupling at runtime, which may not be apparent, but it's something to you have to consider. And that is because if you ever wanted to extract individual modules into separate services, so now you're moving from a modular monolith into a microservice system, and you were using method calls, your implementation would break because now your other module, for example, let's say the catalog module here, if it were a separate application, then those are different memories and you can't execute memory calls. So you would have to re-implement that public interface, probably using HTTP calls over the network to be able to talk to other modules. So now you switched runtime coupling for strong coupling over HTTP. So because of this, there's a, a different approach, which I'm very, I'm more a fan of than the previous one. And this is module communication using messaging. So the benefit of this approach is that it is asynchronous. If modules want to interact with each other, they send messages over a message bus. It is also possible to implement RPC-like calls over a message bus. So if you are familiar with a library that is called Mass Transit, it implements this send a request response uh, communication uh, model where let's say uh, the order module wants to request something from the catalog module, it would send a message to the queue the catalog module would receive this message, handle it, and then send a message back, which would go back to the order module. Now, of course, this abstracts away some important implementation details, like which queues are being used. And also you need some sort of correlation ID between messages so that you know what message you are waiting back. But if you don't want to deal with these complexities, the mass transit library implements this very nicely. So how you interact between modules using messaging is you define contracts or interfaces for your messages. And you can share these contracts using maybe a NuGet package or a shared library where either all your contracts for a single module reside, or you can even share all of the contracts for the entire application and kind of manage them all in one place. So the benefit of communication like this is that it is decoupled. If you do a thought experiment, let's say we want to, again, pull out the catalog module into a separate service. 
if we were using a message bus and everything was going over the bus by sending messages, everything will still function the same because we are not relying on in-memory call to implement communication. We are using an external system which still exists even if we were to go from a modular monolith into microservices. So this is one very big advantage of this approach. Of course, the downside is that you do get reduced performance if you rely on too much messaging. So you, you kind of, you're making a trade-off. If you expect that your modular monolith is realistically going to move into microservices, maybe you're better off using this approach from the start of your project. And again, the benefit is it's easy to extract modules into separate services. So this is kind of the, the high level of how you communicate between your modules. You can either use memory in-memory in method calls or you can use messaging over a message bus. For example, we used a RabbitMQ. Now, another important thing that you need to consider apart from messaging is the independence of data between modules. So every module is responsible for its own data. So this is a constraint that you have to impose on the system because if you break this and you allow sharing of data between your modules, then you're going to end up with a mess. So another rule that you have to enforce in your application is that querying data directly from different modules in the system is not allowed, which comes hand in hand with that, the fact that every module needs to be responsible for its own data. And to achieve this, you have different levels of data isolation that you can resort to. And I'm going to talk about these data isolation levels right now. But again, I want to stress and highlight this again. Every module in your system has to be responsible for its own data. And there is no querying of data from other modules. So you can't directly access the database of other modules. So let's talk about how we can isolate data between modules. So there are four levels. And the first level is no isolation. So everything is in one physical database and there is no isolation between modules. And this is the worst approach possible and definitely the one that you should not even consider. So here the problem is you are probably using foreign keys between tables and different modules, which introduces coupling. So if you tried to extract these tables, you would run into a problem because your foreign keys would now break and so on. So one level up in terms of isolation is still using the same database, but using a different schema per module. So now you're, okay, you're still in the same database, but you're achieving at least logical separation of tables inside of the database. So in the example here, each of the modules from our example architecture has, has its own schema. And another thing that you want to impose here is to not use foreign keys, even though you can, because this is going to make it easier for you to migrate into more constrictive levels of data isolation. And again, each module can only query the tables from its own schema. So no querying between schemas. That's very important to have a proper modular monolith. Now, the next level of isolation, if separate schemas are not enough, is using different physical databases. So let's say we're still using SQL, but each of our modules has its own database. Now this can all be on the same database server, but at least it's a separate physically isolated database. So you can't really easily query between the databases without introducing a distributed transaction and you don't wanna go there. So 
this is probably something that you may want to consider, either this approach or this approach, if you were to start out. And then there is one more level, which is kind of exotic, but if you need this kind of isolation, it's very interesting. And that is, now you have different databases for each module, but you're also using different database type for ex or database management system. So let's say for the order module, we want that relational guarantees and joins. So we opted for a SQL database. Now for the catalog module where we are dealing with products and product information and a lot of unstructured data, we want to use maybe a document database. For the customers module, where we have a lot of relationships between customers, we opted for a graph database and for collaboration for some reason, just to make this slide look better probably, we used a column store database. So you can even do something like this, where you have both physically separate databases between modules and also an entirely different database type, which fits the needs of that module. So you have a lot of freedom when it comes to how much isolation you want to impose on your database. A good start again is probably using either the same database and a different schema per module or using different databases, but still using the same database type. For example, all of your databases are PostgreSQL. And this more or less wraps up the story of how you can build a modular monolith. And I want to share with you a few lessons, a few hardships that we encountered in the previous two years while working on this architecture so that you don't have to make the same mistakes that, that we did. So the first lesson or learning that I would like to share is you should spend more time defining module boundaries. And I promise it's going to pay dividends later. This is because when you're first starting out, you, it really isn't apparent how your system is going to evolve. So if you spend a considerable amount of time at the beginning of the project, just thinking how your system is going to grow, what are the parts of the system that kind of we may want to make independent in the future, you're going to end up with a lot better defined modules. And this is going to allow you to both develop your system faster and kind of later scale it out in a much more performant way. So the next thing is about eventual consistency. And eventual consistency is great. You can achieve it in a modular system, in a modular monolith system. You should definitely use it, but you need to plan for it. So one issue that we ran into was we designed all of our modules to be independent and they were communicating by using uh, messages over a service bus. And we kind of implemented the entire system to be eventually consistent. And we ran into an issue where kind of the eventual consistency came back to bite us. So you have to consider how eventual consistency is going to reflect on your user experience and maybe where you don't have the luxury of using eventual consistency because some changes in your data may be slow to reflect on the user interface. And this is going to be lead to bad user experience. Now, there are ways to, to go around this. For example, your user interface can do eager updates, kind of uh, behave like the update is already applied in the database and wait for the server to respond to kind of confirm, yes, this went through or no, it didn't. Uh, another thing is you can have maybe some sort of WebSockets connection between your backend and your frontend, where as soon as the system converges into an eventually consistent state, 
you notify your application, your front-end application, or other times you're going to have to resort to some way to manage consistency so that it's not eventual, either using distributed transactions, which is something you don't want to do because it's very complicated and slow. Also, maybe something like a two-phase commit, which is again, leaning into distributed transactions. Or you may come to the natural conclusion that, okay, we need consistency here. We can't rely on eventual consistency. So maybe these modules should be merged together. And this is also something that we kind of learned along the way. And it comes kind of as a conclusion of my first point here that you should spend more time defining your modules. What we did was we made possibly too many modules and some of them ended up being chatty. What, what I mean by this is you're going to see that some parts in your system from different modules are going to be communicating with each other very frequently. We can say that they are chatty. So this should lead you to either two conclusions. One is that your module boundaries are messed up. So you put some things of your system into separated modules and they shouldn't be, they should be together. Or your modules are too granular. So you should merge them maybe into one big module and this is going to solve the chattiness. And one last point that I want to highlight is that you need to carefully plan how you're going to share data between your modules. So, and this goes hand in hand with chattiness because chattiness is, uh, occurs because you're probably missing data from one module in the other. So they have to constantly talk to each other. So how do you share data between modules? Probably the most decoupled solution to this, and the one I think you should consider, is you want your modules to be publishing messages whenever some important change occurs. And then the other modules can subscribe to that and possibly store that data into a local copy so that when they need this data, they no need to go to the other module to get it at runtime. So that's one approach. The other approach would be maybe using some sort of caching mechanism. So, okay, if I have to go to the other module to get some piece of information, I'll pay the cost of a network round trip once, and I'm going to cache that data locally so that I can reuse it for some given period of time while that cache is valid. So this kind of wraps up the main pain points that we had in building a modular monolith. And I hope that this was informative. So with this, I'm going to move into the Q&A section.